In the previous videos on social impact, we've looked primarily at sensitive attributes and parts of the population that are particularly at risk of careless use of machine learning. In this video, we'll zoom out a bit and we'll look at the ways society as a whole may be at risk. Since the 1950s, people have been talking about artificial intelligence. The idea that we may build automata that have cognitive abilities rivaling that of humans. In fiction, examples of this are often very human in appearance. They are embodied in human-like bodies, and they function very much the way humans do, if with a slightly metallic voice. One of the more imaginative examples was 2001's HAL, which embodied a spaceship rather than a humanoid body, and spoke with a natural voice. Nevertheless, it still represented a single, quite human intelligence, and the peril in that movie still came from the intelligence behaving against the interests of the humans in a direct adversarial way. As we began to solve some of the problems of intelligence, the intelligent software that entered our lives did not take the form of robotic housemaids, but of simpler, far less intelligent tools that could augment our intelligence. A search engine is a good example. It has no deep intelligence, but it helps us use our own intelligence more effectively. This is the use of intelligent software that has rapidly increased since the early 1990s. A few years ago, machine learning researcher Michael Jordan coined the phrase intelligent infrastructure to capture the era we are entering now. An era when human level intelligence is still some way off, but more and more components of our national and international infrastructure are being replaced by semi-autonomous intelligent components. These include things like tax services automatically generating candidates for fraud investigations, hospitals automatically assigning risk profiles to patients to allocate a doctor's time, recommender systems highlighting relevant news stories and analysis, or banks predicting the risk of loan defaults and setting the interest rates accordingly. Infrastructure here refers not just to the flow of traffic, although that is included, but also to the flow of people in general, the flow of money, and most importantly, the flow of information. Like artificial intelligence, intelligent infrastructure comes with risks. But here the risk is not so simple as the AI not opening the pot bay doors when we tell it to. The risks come primarily from unintended consequences that stay hidden and are difficult to measure. An intelligent infrastructure is not a system that is built and tested all at once. It's something that emerges step by step as people replace human decision making with automated decision making. It's not just controlled by engineers, but also by project managers, commercial third parties, and company managers. At the largest level, the network doesn't even come under the control of one government. Even if Europe gets ahead of the curve, large parts of the infrastructure we use may be hosted in the US or in China where different rules apply and different levels of oversight are possible. In this video, we'll focus on these three basic risks for components of intelligent infrastructure. Feedback loops, blind optimization, and the difference between predictions and actions. We'll start with a classic example. In the 1990s, Pittsburgh Medical Center started a project to investigate ways to make their healthcare more cost-effective, to achieve better results with the same resources. One thing they decided to focus on was community-acquired pneumonia, a lung infection acquired from other people outside of the hospital. Pneumonia is sometimes relatively benign and sometimes leads to sudden and quite severe adverse reactions, and even death. The reasoning was that if risk factors could be identified that predicted such highly adverse reactions, patients could be monitored in a more effective way, and perhaps deaths could be prevented. The researchers trained a rule-based system, a type of machine learning that learns discrete if-then rules that hold for a majority of the data. Such systems are less popular today since their performance tends to be much lower than that of modern methods, but they do have one advantage. If you keep the number of rules small, the model becomes very easy to inspect. You can see exactly what your model has learned in a very interpretable format. And one of the rules the model learned was this one. Patients with asthma had a much lower risk of developing strongly adverse effects from pneumonia. This was a counterintuitive result. Asthma is a lung condition, and any doctor will tell you that catching pneumonia is much more dangerous for an asthmatic person than for others. What happened here was that doctors and asthmatic patients were already being much more careful. Patients with asthma know that they should be more watchful for signs of pneumonia 
and doctors know that such patients require more active care. This is yet another example of our data coming from a biased distribution. Like the planes in World War II, we are not seeing part of the picture. We are not seeing what would happen to asthma patients if they were treated the same as everybody else, so our inference is biased. Here, as then, our predictions are entirely accurate. We can predict very well where planes coming back will be hit, and we can predict very accurately what will happen to asthmatic patients admitted to hospital with signs of pneumonia. What's going wrong are the implied actions we decide to attach to that prediction. More often than not, this is not a conscious choice, and we simply confuse accurate predictions with sound actions. Here's a sketch of how blindly trusting this system would introduce a feedback loop. Before we introduce our system, there is positive feedback from having asthma to the hospital staff being more vigilant, and this improves the outcome. When we train our system, we introduce another variable, the predicted outcome, and our system picks up on the correlation in these two feedback loops and takes asthma to be a predictor for a good outcome. This is a correct inference. However, if we use that prediction to take action naively, we end up reducing the vigilance of doctors towards asthma patients, worsening their outcomes. One of these feedbacks is based on medical expertise, and one is based on trust in our system. In this case, there are two important factors stopping this feedback loop from being put into production and costing lives. First, the fact that a rule-based system was used. This allowed us to inspect what the system was learning and to pick up on the fact that a counterintuitive rule was coming out. Second, the fact that domain experts were consulted, in this case, doctors. A doctor can look at rules like these and tell you that they're wrong, which helps you to see that you've made a fundamental mistake in your reasoning. In this case, the people most affected by the system, asthma patients, would also have been able to tell you this. We call the people that are affected by the system stakeholders, and the people who study the domain of the data, domain experts. Ideally, both should be consulted in the design of a system like this. Note that domain experts and stakeholders can only be involved if the system is made interpretable in some way. If we'd used a deep neural network, looking at hundreds of features and combining them to compute a risk score, we might never have found out to begin with that it was inferring a link between having asthma and having a low risk for adverse effects of pneumonia. This doesn't necessarily mean that your model needs to consist of discrete rules, but it does mean that you somehow need to make the behavior of your system inspectable for people that don't have a machine learning background. How to do this is an active area of research. A key problem in this case is that when we're using offline learning to make predictions, we are taking our data as a static snapshot of the world. That snapshot accurately describes the world, but only the world without our system in it. Once we take actions based on the predictions, our system becomes an additional actor in the world, and our data does not represent the world with that actor in it. In theory, we could deploy the system, gather more data, retrain the system, deploy and repeat. If we're lucky, the system will eventually converge to a stable state where it has the right idea about how asthma influences the outcome. But it only learns this after it has reduced vigilance for a sizable number of patients, likely costing lives. Here is another example. Predictive policing. This is strongly related to the profiling question we discussed in the last social impact video, but it shows that we have a problem even if we take race out of the equation. If we increase the police presence in a particular neighborhood, that will increase the arrest rate. Regardless of whether it's a tranquil or a crime-ridden neighborhood, the more police, the more arrests. Imagine that we want to train a model to predict where the crime in a city is most likely to appear. We don't know exactly where crime is most likely, since many crimes go undetected. An obvious measure to use instead is the number of arrests in a neighborhood. This is called a proxy measure, something that doesn't quite measure what you want to measure, but is close enough and is easier to measure accurately. In this case, it's quite likely that people use arrest rate as a proxy for crime rate without realizing that they're doing it. Of course, you know where this is going. If we build a predictor that includes a neighborhood as a feature and predicts the arrest rate, then we end up with a system that accurately predicts high arrest rates for neighborhoods with high police presence. And if we then interpret arrest rate as a crime rate and increase police presence in these areas, we just end up increasing the disparity in police presence between neighborhoods. If there is some bias to start with in neighborhood police presence, we just end up compounding the problem. 
And note that this is a case where gathering more data and retraining will not solve the problem. Here we only have positive feedback loops, so if we blindly follow the system, every time we retrain, we end up with more concentration of police presence until all the police and all the arrests are in one neighborhood of the city. The system will be making perfect predictions at that point, but it's unlikely to lead to a safer city. Since offline learning is part of the problem, you may ask whether reinforcement learning is a solution here. There's an important difference between reinforcement learning and classical offline learning, because a reinforcement learning model has the option to model itself as an agent in the world. It learns to act rather than to predict. So in theory, it can control the consequences of its actions, even if those actions change the distribution of the data. Of course, that is easier said than done. Just letting a neural network loose in the world and letting it learn by optimization is unlikely to make the world a safer place. First of all, such an algorithm would learn by exploration. It needs to try things and observe the consequences. Letting it produce the vigilance on asthmatic pneumonia patients may eventually lead to sound actions, but if we let it do this in the real world, it will take a long time before it figures out what we already know. Safe reinforcement learning is an active field studying this question, but it's very much in its infancy. Another thing we need to worry about is that the model works on an accurate model of the world. We may set the objective that a self-driving car should get to its destination without running red lights, but if its red light detector is a neural network, then we need to make sure that it doesn't optimize its performance by getting worse at detecting red lights. After all, if its red light detector never fires, it's free to drive as fast as it likes from start to finish without ever stopping. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, reinforcement learning still optimizes a single numeric value. If we pick that value wrongly, we can still build a very dangerous system. Take the predictive policing case. We could build a reinforcement learning system to maximize the arrest rate, but if what we're actually interested in minimizing is the crime rate, then these are not the same thing, and maximizing the arrest rate is much more likely to lead to police nuisance than to actual reductions in crime. The heart of the problem here is the use of proxy measures. We cannot easily measure what we are actually interested in, so we substitute an easily measurable quantity and optimize for that instead. Another case is student evaluations. Taken together with other metrics, these can help to paint a complete picture of a teacher's performance. If, however, we look only at student evaluations, then we are just pressuring teachers to make students happy. For instance, for instance, by setting too easy an exam to reduce the possibility of complaints. A relevant adage here is Goodhart's law, which was originally stated as any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. This was restated in more simple terms by Marilyn Strathern as when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. Often, the proxy measure is really quite a good way to measure what we're interested in. So long as the proxy and the true quantity are correlated and we're a bit careful, we can actually get quite a good idea of what's going on and where the potential improvements are. The problem happens when we put pressure on people to minimize or maximize the proxy measure. Then it stops being a reliable indicator of what we're actually trying to measure. For instance, in many cases, the arrest rate in a neighborhood may be a reasonable proxy for the crime rate. It's not perfect, but it's often close enough, especially when we look at different factors like income, substance abuse, and financial security as well. However, often the police is actively pressured to either minimize the arrest rate to show that crime has reduced or to maximize it to show that progress is being made. And in that case, the crime rate stops being a useful proxy and we need to look at other measurements to see if the pressure is actually working, or if people are just fudging the statistics, or even worse, arresting people that shouldn't be arrested. Here's another example. Chuggers, short for charity muggers. The people with clipboards that charities use to get people to donate in the streets. Let's imagine a charity weighing up whether or not to employ these tactics. Before they do so, they likely keep an eye on how many people sign up to donate. This is an important measure for a charity. It indicates how much income they get, how able they are to survive, how able they are to affect change, 
and also how positive people feel about them. However, the implementation of a tactic like this is likely based on a violation of Goodhart's law. The charity decides to employ chuggers and sees an uptick in registrations concluding that the method must work. In doing so, they forget that donations are just a proxy measure for what they actually care about. If 1 in 20 people sign up to donate, we'll get an uptick in donations. But what about the 19 people that didn't sign up? If they were annoyed by the chugger, their appreciation of the charity will be diminished. They will come away thinking less of the charity and being less receptive to its message in the long run. This is a negative effect of the decision to employ chuggers, but one that is much less easily measured. This illustrates an important effect behind many instances of Goodhart's law being violated. We care about many different things that are hard to measure, so we end up optimizing purely for a single thing that is easy to measure. In many ways, people with machine learning and computer science backgrounds are at an extra risk of this since they are so used to optimizing for single metrics. A strongly related problem is the McNamara fallacy. Robert McNamara was the US Secretary of Defense for most of the 60s and oversaw a large part of the Vietnam War. McNamara was an early pioneer of data-driven management, first as a manager at Ford and then in the US government. During the Vietnam War, the focus was entirely on measurable metrics, often such gruesome ones as the number of Viet Cong and US soldiers killed. All processes and policy decisions were shaped around such statistics. This had two detrimental effects. First, it ignored things that were difficult to measure, such as the Vietnamese sentiment towards the US, which turned the general population against the US and towards the Viet Cong. Second, it incentivized the military to present positive numbers. This led, for instance, to generals putting arbitrary caps on what numbers of enemy troops could be reported, and redrawing categories like the army command structure to make the progress of the war look better, so that Congress would ultimately commit to sending more troops abroad. For more than a decade, the data suggested that the US was winning the war. And then, in the early 1970s, around the time Goodhart first formulated his principle, the US was forced to withdraw. In short, since quantitative measurement is such a powerful tool, it can become addictive, to the point where only easily measured quantities are used to guide policies and decisions. Here's an example a little closer to home. Somewhere in the early 2010s, executives at YouTube decided that they shouldn't optimize their recommendation algorithm for clicks on videos. They should instead optimize for total amount of time spent watching videos. And this was in general a good idea. It's a better proxy measure. Optimizing for clicks leads to people using clickbaity titles and thumbnails with little content behind it. Optimizing for viewing time requires authors to put the work into the content of the video and to keep users watching, and to keep users watching if they want to be promoted by the YouTube recommender systems. But it's still a proxy measure. What's more, YouTube set an arbitrary goal of a billion hours of video watched per day. This didn't just make hours watched the objective for the recommendation algorithm, they made it the objective for the company as a whole. YouTube boosted its recommendation engine with deep neural networks and reinforcement learning, all with a single goal, to increase engagement and keep people watching. The precise effects are difficult to ascertain. YouTube is not forthcoming with details about its algorithm, and researchers only began to study the system quantitatively from the outside in around 2019, by which time YouTube seemed to have tempered its hunger for engagement. Nevertheless, in the years between 2012 and 2019, YouTube faced an extreme amount of scrutiny from the media. Its recommender system was recommending unsuitable content for children, favoring more politically extreme content, and in general doing everything it could to keep people hooked on videos. By contrast, here is Neil Hunt, chief strategy officer at Netflix in 2014, giving a keynote about Netflix's strategies for optimization. And, and the value here. The business value to Netflix is clearly the, the number of new trials we get um, compounded by the retention of those trials, because that's how many people we have paying us $8 a month. Um, retention is very closely predicted. Of all the metrics we can look at, hours of viewing is the one that best predicts retention. It predicts about three quarters of our retention value just from the hours of viewing. And so this one is easy to measure. And so we tend to focus a lot on it. Can we improve hours of viewing in a test cell 
um, across some learning. And so that's, that's where we, we get our value from. But we shouldn't forget that people who watch also tell their friends to generate word of mouth that generates new trials. And that, we'll see in a minute, may actually be a bigger piece of the problem. This is a chart I keep on my whiteboard to keep in mind uh, something very important to me as we think about tests and A-B tests and moving things forward. This is 10 new subscribers engaging in our product. And seven of them are colored green because those guys are going to be very happy with what we've got. And they're going to retain no matter what. And we're going to get the money. In fact, we could send everybody home and we'd have these green guys. Um, and these two guys here, one of them doesn't actually like movies, so I'm not quite sure why he joined. And the other one can't afford it. And he's got his credit card's going to fail. And so they're gone no matter what. And so everything hinges on this one guy in the middle here. And here's the guy on the fence. And all the work we do to make better recommendations, to make discovery easier, to put better choices in front of all of our members. But our testing is seeing whether this one person is influenced to fall on one side of the fence or the other side, not all of these other people. Now remember I said we measured retention to 0.1%. This is really 1,000 people, and we're focusing all our measurement on one guy in the middle, one guy out of 1,000. That's a pretty blunt instrument, because the better recommendations affect everybody, and everybody has a friend that they talk to. And in fact, this guy who is a super extreme consumer of movies maybe tells all of his friends and generates lots of new business for us. But we're not measuring that because this is all off-site and can't be seen. This may be much more important than whether we retain this guy or not. We just don't have a good way to get our hands on it, to measure it, to understand it. And so we should be, think we should be very careful at thinking, how do we influence everybody, not just the, the people we can measure, we can, we can see what's going on for. So that's kind of an interesting thought. Um, there we go. Hours of viewing. We do measure that because it's a good predictor of retention. Um, and this represents a, a sketch of a histogram of, of a number of people watching a different number of hours. And you'll see that the, uh, the median and the average are driven by the very asymmetric distribution. Some people out here are watching, believe it or not, 100 or 200 hours a month, and that really pulls the average up. The median is probably much more significant what the typical consumer is doing. This is 30, 35 hours, something like that. If we change our recommender systems, we make a better algorithm, and it delivers a better result, it's pretty easy, actually, to take these people who are watching extreme high volumes and get them to watch just a little more, or quite a lot more, uh, because they're really uh, flexible. And, and in fact, this particular sketch I did here, the blue curve, actually has depressed the people watching very little, but dramatically extended the people watching a lot. And it moves the average up quite a lot. It actually moves the median down. It's very tempting to measure all hours, or average hours, and you're going to get a wrong signal from that. You're going to lean towards influencing the fringe, who aren't actually the important customers, um, and not the median, uh, who are the important customers. Here's a different algorithmic change. Um, this new algorithm has squeezed the curve. It's shifted the middle up at the cost of delivering less good results for the really extreme users. The average has come down. The median's moved up. Again, we would be tempted to look at the, at the total, but looking at a very specific thing. So we measure to a threshold. We measure, can we get 50% of our test cell to engage at more than 30 hours a, a month? Um, and if we can get 50.1% of the, of the test cell to engage at 30 hours a month, that's a better thing than 50% than, than or 49.9. And that's how we're able to measure the impact on the typical consumer instead of the average consumer, which is not representative. Even after all that, we're still measuring the wrong thing. Because while hours are great predictors, we know that all hours are not created equal. And so how do we get to something that's more fundamental than that? We know that some hours are just addictive filler content, and other hours while short, maybe knock you back in your seat, wow, and that was really compelling. But given that we measure hours, um, our recommender systems might machine learn the value of addictive, because that's what moves the metric, instead of learning the value of compelling, um, which is altogether a different problem, much, much harder to measure. So we really need Note how he explicitly talks about the trade-off between optimizing for new customers and keeping your existing customers happy, the importance of non-measurable metrics like word of mouth, 
The fact that Netflix doesn't optimize for total hours viewed, since this is proportional to the average, optimizing for it means paying disproportionate attention to outliers, the people who are already spending hours and hours on your service. Optimizing for the median focuses your attention on those customers who are spending a moderate amount of time on your service. The fact that the recommender system doesn't know the difference between addictive and compelling content, one hour of content may be a life-changing experience, while six hours of binging 1990s sitcoms may leave you feeling empty and ready to cancel your subscription, but the recommender can only focus on the number of hours you viewed and not the quality of the individual hours. Making your users addicted to your product makes them unhappy in the long term, and for a service like Netflix that is ultimately counterproductive. These strategies and philosophies were followed by Netflix and YouTube more or less at the same time. The picture of YouTube is one of a single metric strategy being pushed top-down by management and shaping the corporate culture as well as the algorithms that it produces. The Netflix picture is one of a management that actively thinks about the limitations of its algorithms, about the things that it cares about that are difficult or impossible to measure, and even about how its technology is affecting the lives of their customers beyond basic engagement. Of course, Netflix has the luxury position that it's not driven by advertisements, but then the combination of advertising and recommender systems may itself be part of the problem. So here is some of the advice that you can hopefully distill from this video to remember when you yourself are asked to implement these kinds of technologies. Beware of optimizing for a single metric. These are almost always proxy metrics and there is almost always these are almost always proxy metrics. Remember Goodhart's law, optimize for one thing, but measure another. Make sure to involve stakeholders and domain experts, and in general to keep humans in the loop. And always remember the distinction between a good prediction and a sound action. Many of these effects aren't new. In fact, Goodhart's law was first formulated in 1975, long before automated decision-making became prevalent. Most of the biases Feedback loops and blind optimization approaches we've seen during these four videos on social impact predate computers and happen just as often in organizations that are made up purely of human agents. The dangers in intelligent infrastructure are in the compounding of all these feedback loops. The lack of human oversight, the monoculture effect of such software being rolled out uniformly across the globe, and finally in the danger that each institution optimizes its own systems for local benefits like revenue without looking at the global effects. And with that, we come to the end of the last social impact video in the course. We hope that this has given you some appreciation of the damage that these technologies can do if they are rolled out carelessly. But equally, we hope that you can see the potential of these technologies for highlighting and addressing the biases that exist in society. It's not that the technology is inherently bad or harmful, it's just that it needs to be carefully and responsibly used.